Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell. You'll get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And when I'm not asking Bruce, hey, how big was Batista's? Well, you know. One of the things I like to do is help people save money. And if you're watching this video right now and you're in a 30 year loan, man, you're overpaying your single biggest bill and you may not even realize it. I want you to do a little experiment for me. Take your calculator out, multiply your monthly house payment by 360 payments. That's how many payments there are on a 30 year loan. That big scary number, that's your total of payments. You're looking at that number? You know you can do better. Keep more of your own money right now and go to savewithconrad.com. Or maybe you've got credit card debt. Man, it's not a matter of if I can save you money with that. Your average interest rate on a credit card is more than 20%. And by the way, all the interest you pay on those credit cards, it's not tax deductible. Whereas the mortgage interest, well, that is tax deductible. So if you owe this debt, it's up to you how to pay it back. Doesn't it make sense to get the cheapest rate possible and the greatest tax deduction possible? Find out how much money you can save right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com. You don't need perfect credit, even scores in the 500s can be approved, and it's no cost out of pocket. But maybe best of all, we're licensed in more than 40 states. We can help more families than ever before. But how much can we save you? Find out right now for free with a quick quote from SaveWithConrad.com. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson, and you're listening to Something to Wrestle With. Bruce Pritchard. Bruce, what's going on, man? How are you? You know, dog, just another day in the neighborhood and well, another bone. We're excited to be with you. Of course, we know last week you, uh, had some family stuff. We're back in the saddle and we're bringing you what we were supposed to bring you last week in your house four. and, uh, originally scheduled today was taboo Tuesday, 2005. We'll try to get to that one very, very soon, but I thought that today we should go back in time and revisit 1995. In your house for the great white North. It was a pay-per-view on October 22nd, back in 95 in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada. Hey. That's the Winnipeg arena. You idiot. 10,339 fans were in attendance. About 9,000 were reported as being paid fans. The gate is $127,976. That's the best gate for an in your house show to date. Uh, is this more based on the. You know, the idea that it's still a, a rather early incarnation of in your house or more because the fans in Canada are hot, 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 Bruce. Well, shit. I, th I think that the fans of Canada have always been pretty fucking hot. And this was just during a time we hadn't been in Canada for a pay-per-view and for television uh, in particular, just due to the high cost of doing business, going across the border, back and forth with visas and all that shit. But you know, Canada was a, a little different set of, you know, I, I, what the fuck am I trying to say? I was going to say set of pace, but just a little different pace at that time. Okay. I'm tongue tied, I'm tongue -tied already. I like it. You're not hot at me about that. Are you? Yeah. I'm hot at you. Well, what, what did I do now? You showed up. Oh yeah. Uh, so here's the deal. This is, uh. I think the first pay-per-view event from Canada since like WrestleMania six in 1990. So more than five years since old Canada had a pay-per-view, they were probably starved for a little special WWF action. It's also the fourth in your house event of the year. The observer would report that there was a huge local media push leading up to the event that has to help uh, 95. We're not exactly setting the houses on fire, uh, but a huge local media push is that probably because you guys had a good local promoter. Well, you know, it was more along the lines of Carl DeMarco and Carl DeMarco approached, which don't take this the wrong way. Cause I'm not knocking it, but Carl promotes approached every event as if it were WrestleMania. So no matter what the event, whether it was a live event, a pay-per-view, a television taping, I, Carl wanted to have press conferences. Carl wanted to, to have talent in and out of the market on the way there as much press as he could possibly generate from everything. And again, it, it became kind of a pain in the ass because you were doing this for markets that wouldn't bring the return that say in New York or uh, Dallas or uh, LA or Chicago would do. But yet we were pouring all of this into Canada to build Canada up a little bit more. And 
it was asking an awful lot of the talent. It was asking an awful lot of everyone. But again, to the promoter's point of view, I think every event should be a WrestleMania promotion and you should put everything that you can into it. Just sometimes it's hard when you're promoting every other day of the week as well. Let's talk about some uh, rumor and innuendo. There was disputed information about how many buys this pay-per-view did at the time. The WWF allegedly told the observer it did around 0.8 or 200,000 buys, a number that would be almost as high as SummerSlam, which that year did 205,000 buys sources at viewers choice and WCW both told Dave, it was between 0.35 and 0.4. That's barely a hundred thousand buys. And that number is also in line with in your house five, which we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode. Meltzer would say if the WWF figures are accurate, then in your house was a success financially. And the in your house series is comfortably holding its own using the other figures as mentioned last week, the most recent show's performance was an outright disaster. I know you normally take great issue with any time I start a sentence by Dave Meltzer wrote, but you would eventually do away with this two hour reduced price pay-per-view concept, bump it back up and, uh, add the other third hour at the full price. So clearly something wasn't working. Uh, do you remember f- financially? Was this a huge success or just sort of there? Dude, I, I couldn't tell you one way or another, but I'm sure if Dave Meltzer reported it, that it, that it is probably incorrect. Um, again, I, I don't have the goddamn numbers in front of me. I have no idea what the hell it did, but I can pretty much guarantee you based on the track record of the observer and of its editor in chief, I would probably say that it was much closer to incorrect than being anywhere close to the truth. Meltzer would say, uh, the WWF in your house series has to be reevaluated. The idea that lowering the price would bring a new audience or for that matter, just sustain the old audience for shortened and less hyped shows has now proven to be a fallacy. Not every idea is a winner and maybe it was worth investigating, but each in your house pay-per-view has seen the audience steadily decrease to record lows. WCW going to monthly shows all full price and pushing as equal events. Haven't seen this numbers decrease nearly as far. Although WCW's two advantages are it didn't have as much of a distance to fall and Hulk Hogan's name value means more to the casual audience than everyone else may be put together. It appears that it doubled the price, meaning WCW changed to $27.95 for Halloween Havoc, that WCW will have far more buys for its most recent show. A lot to unpack here. There is certainly the discussion of perceived value, that if something is expensive, it's valuable, and if something is uh, free, it's worthless. Um, Was there a concern early on that maybe we need to abandon the in your house concept or did Vince just want to go full steam ahead and hadn't quite yet made the decision after four. Well, I think that there was the problem of perception and and that comes with when you're looking at the value of something and we were giving them two hours. Um, sometimes the shows were better than our major pay-per-views, but again, to the average audience, you're getting an hour less of content and you're paying less. So just by definition, when you look at the monthly pay-per-views of the competitor, in this case, WCW, where they were still doing three hour shows, they were still doing it at a higher price point that in looking at ours, it's like, well, then this must be less than based on the price point and based on the length of the event. Um, we didn't think initially that the audience was going to be there monthly. We, we didn't think that they would pay full price for a monthly pay-per-view. We were proven wrong and changed eventually from the in your house format to, Hey, if we're going to go monthly, go with major pay-per-views monthly. It doesn't cost any more to produce three hours than it does to produce two hours. And the return is going to be greater. Obviously, the same number of buys at $27 is better than the same number of buys at 19 So, you know, yeah, we were evaluating everything along the way. Let me ask, and I hate to be silly, but I can't help but ask. Do you think in In Your House 3, 
with Diesel and Sean's win where they won the tag titles and it was overturned the next night on Raw. Do you think perhaps that hurt the In Your House series or specifically this event? The idea being if you tune in to see a major happening, a major show, and then they just undo it the next night on Raw, to use an old school phrase, does that sort of kill the town a little bit? I don't know if it I don't know if it does, but yeah, but at the same time, yeah, it does. Um, so that's both sides right there. Uh, it, in general, I think that the in your houses kind of became the, the live event to, to draw the next live event. I'll use Houston, Texas as an example, back in the day when it was a weekly territory and you, you always use the event before to promote to your next event. Well, in this case, we were using the in your house is almost to get to TV and get to the next in your house before you got to the big one. So it was, I think it was just, uh, it was a perception thing more than anything. We're a month away uh, from uh, WCW trying a battle royal type gimmick. It's going to be called World War Three. There you go, real title on that. But I do think it's worth mentioning that there was some speculation that perhaps WCW running that in November could hurt the Royal Rumble pay per view in January. And of course, we know, well, World of War Three is going to suck as a concept. Royal Rumble, however, is going to maintain its status as being one of the top shows of the year. But when you hear, wait a minute, they're going to do multiple rings and way more guys than, than we have, perhaps as an attraction that could hurt us. Does that even cross your mind? Or did you think that at this point, the Royal Rumble was so well established that wasn't nobody touching that? I don't think that the Royal Rumble concept was in jeopardy at all. And I don't think anyone really gave that a second thought. Um, I've always been a big fan of the two ring battle Royal. I've always been a fan of the two ring six man tag team matches and being able to utilize two rings to your advantage, um, and make it a special event. So I was intrigued. I'll admit on the three ring circus, which is what it eventually turned into of, of WCW. And that's the one that was just fucking horrible with, with like 800 people in it and everything. Yeah. A ton of people yeah. hard to watch. I mean, it's just hard to figure out, you know, what action to call and all that. That's one of those that you look at and you kind of say, well, as a spectacle, I, I got to see what the hell it's going to be. Um, however, is, is the product at the end of the day is kind of like, Oh fuck, I'm sorry. I looked because it was, it was not good, but compared it to the rumble. No, there was never any, Oh my God, they're going to do this 800 man three ring battle Royal thing. And people are going to want that more than the rumble. The rumble was a concept and I think it was safe. We've talked about this a lot before in our Shawn Michaels episode. So check it out in something to wrestle.com. But I do want to briefly mention that we've got some major news as we head into this show, the famous or rather infamous incident involving Shawn Michaels being beaten up outside of a Syracuse club happened not too far before this. It was Friday, October 13th. Shawn Michaels is hanging out with uh, Davey boy Smith and uh, the one, two, three kid. They're at a club having a little night out on the town. And they're on their way out and different reports would indicate that Michaels may or may not have flirted with someone inside that perhaps he shouldn't have. And, uh, I guess it's pretty well established from everyone who was in the conversation that he had maybe been overserved, maybe a little, a little too tipsy. And in the police report, apparently largely derived from Waltman, the men who instigated the incident were yelling insults at the driver of the car, Donna Jones, and not at Sean Michaels. The police report stated that Michaels was in the front seat, but was intoxicated and passed out and actually asleep when he's pulled out of the car and pummeled. He effectively had no chance to defend himself. And the police report stated that Sean would suffer a laceration on the right eyelid and right below the cheek, two black eyes swelling. And of course, blood coming from the ears and the right eye. Oof, pretty bad deal. And it stated that there were three people in the back seat of this two door car. Sean Waltman, Davy boy Smith, and a third person named Robert Jones with Davy boy in the middle between the two, which because of his size and it being a two door car, 
uh, probably compounded the time that it took for him to get out of the car and try to help his pal, Sean Michaels. And the police reported at the time there were 10 assailants, not nine and said the fight was ultimately broken up by the driver of that vehicle, Donna Jones. It was apparently the girlfriend of a bouncer at the club 37 in the Ponderosa Plaza in Syracuse, all of which where this was taking place in front of. And, uh, she ran into the club and two bouncers came out and the perpetrators escaped. And wouldn't you know it, two white Ford Broncos. Uh, one of the Broncos turned around and attempted to run over one of the bouncers. And the police report stated that nothing about the perpetrators being Marines or servicemen. Although the entire group had the old short crew cut style haircuts. Well, we've talked about this a lot. It's certainly been discussed a lot. You guys are going to turn it into an angle and we'll talk about that momentarily, but what's the word you remember hearing when you first get the report that one of your biggest stars, sort of the next big thing, and maybe the occasional pain in your ass at quite the night here in Syracuse. Well, I got the call later that night, um, at home. So we were made aware of it, um, the wee hours of the morning and no one really knew what condition that Sean was in at that point, other than he'd had the hell beat out of him and was in a local hospital. So anything more than that, we just didn't, didn't really know, didn't know how bad his head injuries were or anything else. So it was Jim Myers, I believe, uh, George Animal Steel, who was the agent on record that was there that night that I believe is the one that went to the hospital to try and find out what the hell happened. But, you know, there, there've been so many different stories and so many different versions of what actually took place and the people that were involved in it. I dare say weren't in any condition to really remember what the hell actually took place. So your guess is probably as good as mine as to what really happened that night. And, and I think that from all the different versions, somewhere in the middle lies the truth but all we really know for sure is at the end of the day, Sean had the living shit kicked out of him, had a bad concussion and uh, a lot of injuries coming out of it and fucked up a lot of shit. Was there any heat on uh, Sean or Davey on the uh, Waltman or Davey on the other side of this? I think there was more than anything, a, an awareness, like what the fuck are you doing? Uh, being that messed up and going out and the boys look after the boys. So it was, where the hell were you? You know, what happened? And don't go out and get so screwed up that you don't remember what the hell happened. So it was an opportunity for a, a lesson to be learned, hopefully from some people and don't be stupid more than anything. We should mention the next year at the slammies, Brent Hart couldn't help himself. And he made a comment about the quote unquote, nine cheerleaders who beat up Sean in Syracuse. And he sort of challenged the authenticity of the incident. Uh, there's lots of conspiracy theories in wrestling. And certainly in this era, a lot of people had already decided they didn't like Sean Michaels. And, uh, some of that includes people who wrote newsletters, but was there ever any doubt as to whether or not this was legitimate when you've got a couple of witnesses there? Well, not only a couple of witnesses, but you're checked into a hospital with yeah. your eyes swollen shut and, and concussions and unconscious and just look, if it were a work, it was a hell of a work. Oh, I'm not insinuating it was a work I mean, at all. It's just, it feels, it feels unnecessary that people, oh, it was nine cheerleaders and oh, he must not have wanted to drop a belt or it's like. Uh, did you see him? Uh, it, it's not exactly like he made that up. And we should mention that midweek, uh, Sean Michael sees a neurosurgeon who advises him against taking the trip to Winnipeg and strongly advises against him wrestling. And Meltzer would be critical of this and saying that perhaps a announce an announcement should have been made prior to the pay-per-view and they should have gotten in front of this. Do you agree in hindsight, maybe it could have been handled a little better than ultimately what you guys wound up doing at the pay-per-view? I think if we had actually had, you know, things set up differently as far as doctors seeing Sean and being able to get to Sean 
and make that determination. It was one of those where, from our vantage point, we hadn't seen Sean, we hadn't talked to Sean, and, and you're hearing a lot of this and a lot of that. So you, if it's that bad, you want him to be checked out by doctors and to know exactly what the hell the extent of the damages are. So I think that there was some doubt and probably some hope that maybe it's not as serious as we think. And I think you hang on to that glimmer of hope at times, um, oftentimes too often that you, you get bit. And this is an opportunity. This is an opportunity. This is one of those situations where we got bit. Uh, we'll talk about, uh, Sean Michaels appearance on the show in a little bit, but we should mention this whole incident was acknowledged on Monday nitro, uh, with one of, uh, main Gene's uh, 900 line come ons where he said a WWF star came out on the short end of a fight with a fan, which is, uh, not exactly what happened. It's uh, it, do you just look at that when you hear that they're, they're poking fun at this and think, ah, oh, this is just them being quarter hot about the whole billionaire, Ted and nacho man and huckster shit. I think it's a combination of all the above. And I just thought, I always thought that those 900 numbers were usually in poor taste anyway. And it's, it's just like the headlines that you read today for the dirt sheets and to try it's, it's clickbait and it was dial bait, I guess back then, but not a big fan of it. Yeah. It's, you know, less than ideal. Did you, did you ever dial the 900 number and, and get mean jeans uh, tip or JR's boy, you want to really ask me a question we've never talked about before, but. I, I had a little bit of a no, scam. Man, that's why I asked you the question. I had a scammer hookup. I had a, a, a back dial, a backdoor number to call. And I got to hear the shit every day and didn't pay a dollar. Back in 1995? Well, 97. 97, uh, I could get the did W. Did you ever call it before you had the hookup? No. I had to get my parents' permission. I'm not an asshole. Okay. Well, how old were you then? In 95? Yeah. 14. Oh, okay. I was also not watching wrestling. So, but at 16, you had a hookup. Yes. Well, that's just fucked up, Connie. Once I learned to drive, I just drove around town until I found somebody. <laughs> <laughs> he had somebody giving out uh, codes on hey, the corner. Hey, hey little boy. You got, the, you got that WCW holler. What's main Gene saying today? Hey. Yeah, uh, I, you look, man, I wasn't, I didn't like ours. Uh, I just thought that it was kind of uh, stemming from that dirt sheet world and that, that dirt world. Um, I always loved the national Enquirer because of the dirt. Um, but I knew that it was dirt that 99% of it was bullshit, but you, you know, he kind of went there. And so I understood the attraction to it. But at the same time, I'm kind of like, good Lord, man. Um, it was all just a scam to get you to, to pay that $2 a minute. Oh, it's 99 God, cents a minute. God damn it. At one, nine hundred, nine Oh nine, ninety nine hundred. Uh, okay. Anyway, let's talk ours? about No, that was mean. Je oh, scheme jeans. Okay. His was way better than yours. No, it wasn't. Oh yeah. Ours was truthful. Sure it was. Let's talk about the, the rough week Shawn Michaels had. So we know he gets the hell beat out of him on October 13th, October 5th. He's at an afternoon charity show at Madison square garden. And Shawn Michaels was allegedly confronted by the blue brothers in the dressing room. According to the story, Don Harris put a chair against the dressing room door to keep anyone from coming in. And Ron Harris snatched Michaels by the throat and held him against the wall or shoved him into the wall, depending on who you believe. Michaels had a scare thrown into him. It wasn't roughed up or hurt to the point he missed any dates, but the blue brothers final night with the promotion was four days later. So no disciplinary actions taken, but there's a lot of rumor and innuendo as to what went down here and what created this incident. But most people just say, well, personal disagreements. And that's not exactly a stretch. When you think about the heat seeking missile that Shawn Michaels was in this era. Do you remember the blue brothers, Ron and Don wanting to beat the hell out of Sean? 
Yeah, I don't think they were alone. I think that there were probably a lot of guys that may have wanted to beat the hell out of Sean during this time period in his career. Um, the Blues Brothers, big guys, tough guys, great guys, uh, actually. I mean, super nice guys. And the sidebar, I just, the, they were two guys that I kind of looked at and went, shit, they're, they should have done so much more in the business. And that's yeah. one of those situations of, of that it factor that you couldn't put your finger on because they were big, they were nasty, had a great look and they weren't bad workers. Right. So it, it just was one of those and two nicer guys you couldn't find. So that was always a puzzle in, in some ways, but Look, I heard the same rumors. The only people that know what actually happened, if it, if anything did at all, is going to be Ron and Don and Sean. Ron, Don, and Sean. That sounds like a fucking uh, a 60s joke. hip-hop song. Yeah. They, they walk into a bar. Yeah. Only one gets drug out by non-Marines. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Sean's not the only one who's going to suffer some injuries during this era. The company re receives word that The Undertaker has now suffered a broken orbital bone, which is the bone that holds your eye in your eye socket. Uh, several days earlier, he's going to be out of action for at least one month. He will definitely miss the October 22nd show in Winnipeg where his match was, uh, supposed to be the main event against King Mabel, or at least the semi main event. And we know when he shows back up, he's got an interesting looking mask on. And, uh, apparently the injury happened on October 7th in Providence, Rhode Island, working against, well, who else? Mabel. Apparently Mabel went to throw a clothesline, but Undertaker wasn't close enough to him and his fist cracked Undertaker in the eye and not realizing the severity of the injury. Wouldn't you know it? Undertaker continues to work scheduled matches against Isaac Yankum the next three dates before the pain becomes unbearable. And he finally has to have his face examined and, uh, it's uh, less than ideal. He's going to have to have surgery. Of course, late in the week, the WWF is going to create a storyline around the incident, claiming the injury was from a beating suffered at the hands of Mabel and Yokozuna during a six man tag that aired on October 9th on raw. And on then on the October 16th raw, it's announced that Yokozuna is going to replace the undertaker as Mabel's opponent on the pay-per-view. This is not exactly uncommon. To hear that Mabel hurt somebody. There's a pretty famous story that we've talked about before with Kevin Nash working with Mabel and a back injury where he felt like Mabel didn't take care of him. But now you're hurting, you know, the, the godfather of the locker room, the guy who holds wrestler court, the most respected man. And you legit broke his fucking face. What do you remember about undertaker's injury here? Was there any heat on Mabel? It was Mabel already starting to earn a reputation. What can you tell us? Well, Mabel had definitely earned the reputation. And then first, you know, it, it is kind of difficult to injure the undertaker because he's a war horse that he's that ever ready battery bunny that just keeps going and keeps going and keeps going energizer. But yeah, so that's same. Okay. And our energizer. I like ever ready, but it's energizer. Well, I, I'm going to start texting you. Are you ever ready to tape? That's that. Yeah. <laughs> I was, was there, I was ready earlier today than you bullshit texted you this okay. morning. You didn't respond. I told you, wait, we should go ahead and now we're a few minutes into the show. We probably should have did this right at the top of the show. You and I both individually thought the world of Tracy Smothers. One of my all time favorite wrestlers to watch. I was so entertained by him. I still think his match, uh, teaming with the, with Armstrong as the wild eyed Southern boys against the midnight express, great American bash 90 is one of the all time greatest shows. One of the all time greatest matches. The motherfucker wrestled a bear. He worked with y'all as Freddie Joe Floyd. He entertained us all in ECW dancing around, pretending to be Italian from Nashville, Italy, just a hell of a guy. We had the pleasure of hanging out with him here in Huntsville last year, myself and Tony Schiavone for one of our Patreon get togethers. It just. It feels like it's way, way too soon. And I don't think I've ever heard anybody who ever worked with him or met him say anything other than what a great guy Tracy Smothers was. Yeah, it's way too soon, man. Tracy was 58 years old 
and a super nice guy that I've known God I knew Tracy all the way back to mid South days and just, you know, he, he, he lost the battle to cancer, um, tough son of a bitch. And I'm, I'm, you know, yeah, may he rest in peace. I've had a, uh, As you know, I've had just kind of a fucked up last two weeks with, with, uh, a lot different, a lot, a lot going on, uh, personally. And it just, when you hear that and it just puts things in perspective for you a little bit, because he's one year older than I am and in that quick and, and he's gone. And I feel like I just saw him. And it was over a year ago uh, at, at one of these conventions. And I remember sitting with him in, in a show that uh, Gary Dameron had. And Tracy and I sat there and watched the whole show. And the enthusiasm that Tracy had for the entire show from start to finish and talked to every single guy and had a comment on everything, but out of love and out of just sheer enjoyment. Um, Tracy was a great guy. He's going to be missed. And, you know, it's it's just really a shame. And cancers, you know, for those of you out there, if you can help, um, that's one out of everything. That's the only thing that, that I really... I really hate and, and fight and just uh, cancer sucks and Tracy's going to be missed. And, and I'm in a, I'm just kind of at a loss for words. Really. He was uh, apparently diagnosed with lymphoma on November 14th of last year. And less than a year later, he was gone. And I think all of us just assumed he was going to kick out and uh, unfortunately it didn't happen, but man, what a legacy he's going to leave behind. I hope everybody listening to this will go seek out some Tracy Smothers stuff. And I hope you see some of his indie stuff that he did. That's not as widely publicized as his WWF or WCW, or for that matter, ECW or Smoky mountain stuff. But man, he had such a rap on the Indies. Everybody dies and spell out thug and dude, it's just the best. And, uh, if you saw Tracy Smothers, you know, you got your money's worth. I don't know that anybody I've ever met loved wrestling as much as he did. And, uh, we just lost a great man and sorry for bringing the show down right in the middle, but that was one of the things I texted you this morning. It just sort of caught me by surprise because if I'm honest, we've been putting some shows in the can with Jim Ross and Arn Anderson and a few others, and I would plug his GoFundMe every single time. And. It's just, you know, I just assumed, Hey man, he's going to beat this. And then we're going to help him with his hospital bills. And it didn't happen. And, uh, it sucks. Yes, it does. I still doesn't forgive you for, um, Hey, I do want to mention segue from, from being late tonight. You, you, you said earlier, you had a lot of personal stuff going on. I feel like we need to clarify. You're not sick. You're fine. No, these are family members who have been, yeah. And some challenging stuff that's required a little bit of travel and we had to play best of last week, but we're pulling the nose up and everything's going to be okay. And Bruce is fine. So, uh, little thoughts and prayers for his family would go a long way right now. But first let's, uh, send those thoughts and prayers to the Smothers family. I don't know how to transition now to talk about big van Vader, but I'm going to try, uh, WCW told Vader on uh, October 11th, they're letting him go. And the official reason for the firing is his 90 day review window had passed. And that since he was medically unable to wrestle because of a shoulder injury, they're canceling the contract on that basis. And they're saying specifically in the newsletters, the Paul Orndorff thing will never be mentioned for legal reasons. Uh, it's just going to be a, a messy situation, but Meltzer does say it puts Leon in a pretty interesting position because every promotion in the world is going to want to work with him. And of course we know. In January, here he comes and he's going to make quite the entrance and he's programmed with Shawn Michaels. And I know you weren't always the biggest WCW fan, but occasionally you guys would pick up some incredible talent there. You know, guys like Cactus Jack, Steve Austin, but Vader, not only was he the first of that acquisition of those three, but 
perhaps the biggest. I mean, a couple of years prior to this, he's not only the WCW champ, he's headlining every pay-per-view as their number one heel. And you probably needed some big time heels, especially since one of your big heels like Mabel, he's injuring motherfuckers left and right. How excited were you to get your hands on Vader? You know, initially very. And I think that when you looked at the potential of Leon, it was all you saw was an upside. And I think that unfortunately I, I get a lot of heat for this. I know, but, uh, I think that Leon's best years were behind him at that point. And once Leon came up and you saw how Leon had to work to get over, it's okay. But you also have to, to work to get other people over too. Um, it just was, yeah, it was different, but yes, we were excited initially because you looked at this big bastard and you'd heard the legends, you know, and everything seen, I, I, I loved the headdress and everything with the, damn cot coming out of it and shit that he wore out in japan but i never i never got you know beyond that and i think that leon worked himself kind of back into a corner because really you know what he did was beat people up well eventually you got to do the job eventually you got to um as a heel uh, eventually somebody's got to conquer you. And that, that was an uphill climb, I think for, for Leon and, and a lot of people and the backstage incident with Orndorff and the lure of the tough guy, uh, Leon white, um, had that had tarnished that reputation, that image a little bit because inside the behind the scenes of the business, I think people looked at him kind of as, uh, a bully that got his comeuppance from Paul Orndorff and that, that legend and tough guy lore, uh, wasn't there anymore. And it was, <laughs> you know, yeah, we would have loved to have had him unscathed, but, uh, still, I think we were pretty happy to have him. Well, let's see how happy you were to have Bill Watts at the September 24th event in Saginaw, Michigan. Vince would announce that, uh, at a team meeting that Bill Watts is now in charge of the creative aspects of Titan sports business. And Vince would say that he's stepping back to act more as a company executive. And while he will oversee Bill Watts, he will not overrule him. Of course, it only took a few weeks before Watts apparently taking those words seriously was overruled and felt like he didn't have the authority he expected. And he quits the company and, uh, the week is now filled with rumors about the fraying relationship between the 56 year old Bill Watts and Vince McMahon. Meltzer would write rumors started in midweek that Watts had left the company after a blow up with Vince, which were immediately denied by the company. Apparently earlier in the week, perhaps on Tuesday, since that's the day the company does voiceovers for syndication, there was a blow up involving Watts and other company employees, not involving McMahon, who was busy doing television, announcing voiceovers for syndication. And it was all over his office, not being ready. The rumors quickly spread both in and out of wrestling that Watts was gone. Or according to those close to the situation, Watts had quit, but was quickly talked out of it. And others were saying it was just simply a disagreement, not involving Vince in any way. Either way, Watts was still working on Wednesday and Thursday before officially quitting on Friday after a meeting with McMahon. Among the wrestlers, the belief was that the quitting was over the two having a disagreement about the future of the creative end of the company regarding WrestleMania 12 and after that show. Others who probably would be more reliable and have a better read on the situation claim it was simply a matter of power and authority and that booking things like who would be on top or the style of wrestling in the ring had nothing to do with it. Watts wanted to make major changes within the company in regard to the discipline of wrestlers perhaps similar to when he was in WCW and became such a popular figure with the boys, instituting fines for being late to the building, wanting heels and baby faces to be kept apart in public and wanting the wrestlers to get more serious about their house show matches, including uh, banning playing cards in the dressing room before the matches, because he felt the wrestlers could spend their time being better with their opponent and talking about their match. Uh, McMahon apparently felt the system was running fine as it was. And the discipline was not a problem amongst the wrestlers. 
Watts, who thought he was going to have full authority over this aspect of the business and be the number two person in the company. When he found out he wasn't immediately resigned on October 13th. And, um, during a shoot interview with Sean Oliver over at kfabecommentaries.com, Kevin Nash told the story how he told Watts that up here, I eat you on the food chain while putting him in his place backstage. Did you ever hear about this story with diesel? What do you remember about the blow up with production on Tuesday? And ultimately, why did he leave on Friday as best you understand it? Yeah, there was no blow up with production on on that Tuesday in any way, shape or form there, you know, Bill, Bill was Bill. And, um, I, I had to chuckle. There was somewhere in there where you said that the, that he was a popular figure. What that was WCW cl- clearly tongue in cheek. Um, yeah. Cause I, I can't remember a time that Bill was ever a popular figure backstage, um, with very few exceptions. But, you know, Bill came in and Bill uh, heard what Bill wanted to hear. And Bill wanted to hear that he was second in charge and that he would have final say. It's Vince's company. Vince is the boss. That's what makes uh, the company go round is that the buck does stop somewhere. And the buck stops at Vince McMahon's desk. And Bill wasn't fond of that arrangement and thought that he was the one guy that could change it and be the end all be all and have power to do whatever it is that he wanted to do whenever he wanted to do it. That just wasn't going to work. So Bill had a blow up uh, with Lisa Wolf. He had a blow up with uh, some other folks came over because Bill was working with Pat Patterson and myself and Bill came over, wanted to quit. And we were like trying to talk to Bill and telling him to calm down and chill out and just talk to Vince, you know, don't, Don't let this other shit get in the way of potentially, you know, your job. And I know Bill, you know, wanted to just be right. Bill wanted to be able to say to anybody in the corporate structure, hey, fuck you, you're fired, get the fuck out. That's not the way it works uh, in business. And it wasn't, it wasn't going to work here. So the bill stayed a few more days. And, and I remember getting the, getting the phone call and he said, it goes, guys, I just quit. Talked to Vince. I'm driving home to Bixby right now. And took his rental car, took his Ford Taurus and drove from Stanford to Bixby, Oklahoma that night. But it was bill being bill and bill not wanting to accept that anybody had, uh, power above his head and he wanted autonomy and that was just wasn't going to happen. I always laugh whenever I hear the example of playing cards in the locker room because that happened at a, a live event in Boston. Uh, Bill and I actually rode up to the, to the show together. And when we got there, I had never played um, gin and all the boys played gin and all shit. And Jerry Lawler was sitting there and, and all this stuff. And Jerry asked me, he goes, you want to play a game of gin? And I said, I don't know how to play. And he said, well, I'll teach you. So Lawler and I are sitting in the dressing room and we're playing gin. And Bill came in and I, I remember exactly where the fuck we were sitting and, and everything. Because Bill came in the door and Lawler and I were sitting there playing gin. And, and Bill said, he goes, hey, Jerry, um, I uh, want we'll to talk to you about your match. He says, all right, let me finish this hand. I'll, I'll come right in. And that went up Bill's ass sideways. So next thing you know, we get back on Monday. Bill sends out a, a deal company-wide into all the talent. No more, like a whole list of rules. You couldn't play cards <laughs> in the locker room anymore. All this other shit, you know, the K Fabin and everything else. And Lawler calls me and says, you know, hey, do you think that was uh, that was us? I said, I know that was us. And um, so, yeah, Lawler and I were responsible for the card playing thing. It's a good little sidebar. Yeah, but it was uh, come on. I mean, we we literally finished that hand in a minute and Lawler went and and talked to him. It feels like at times Bill Watts could be like uh, a type of parent who would say, why? Because I said so. Yes. 
definitely. He, he definitely was. And it was it was his way or the highway in his in his mind. There wasn't an alternative way to do things. If you brought up something, the answer was no, because it wasn't his idea. And that wasn't what he had fucking laid out for tonight. Let's, uh, let's talk about the Kevin Nash quote. What do you make of this, uh, up here? I eat you on the food chain comment. I don't, uh, obviously I wasn't there. If Kevin said that I, I was there for Kevin and, and Sean, uh, being very gracious to bill anything you need, man. Hey, let us know we're on your side. You know, we, we want to get better whenever you got any ideas for us, man, let us know. And, and we'd love to shoot stuff by you and everything and, and work with you. So I don't know, but I mean, he's, I, I wasn't there. So I have no idea whether Kevin said that or not. When Kevin's there with Bill Watts, he's working like the stupid Vinny Vegas gimmick in WCW. So he's like captain undercard. And then when Watts joins up with the WWF, well, things are different. He's the champ. Now he's got Vince's ear. Could you see Vin? Could you see uh, Kevin Nash saying something like that? I, I don't know. I, I, you know, frankly, I think that Kevin, um, would have been smarter than to say something like that. I think Kevin's too good of a worker. I think Kevin would have worked him. I think Kevin would have been, Kevin's a charming son of a bitch. Oh, one of the best ever. Yeah. So I, I, to me, I could see Kevin, you know, trying to charm the pants off bill. Unless but, he tried to pull some of the old cowboy bill white stuff where he's going to puff his chest out and act like he's going to beat everybody's ass in the locker room. And then old South Detroit boy probably ain't putting up with a bunch of that shit. If I had to guess. Not say it didn't happen. I don't know, but I definitely bill Watts was puffing his chest out and letting everybody know that by God my way or the highway and guys just go right around bill and walk into Vince's office and, and yeah. say, Hey, and, you know, in, in, in fairness, you, you kind of, and Lord, I'm not trying to defend bill Watts, but when they know they can undermine you like that, you sort of neuter bill. Do you not? Well, again, I think that it was bill's perception of what he was brought in to do bill was brought in to work with the creative work with the talent. And in doing that, you're working with Vince. So maybe to set a better way, bill thought his job was to get the boys in line. And really his job was to get the boys over. Yes. Okay. Let's talk about the uh, thing we know for sure in your house Four sucked. The readers of the wrestling observer gave it 5.4% thumbs up 5.1% thumbs in the middle an unbelievable 89.4% thumbs down. Woo. Not a great show. Before we get into the actual show, there's a dark match before the, uh, the pay-per-view is live and it's Bob Holly pinning rad Radford. And what was described as an average opener. Of course, we know Bob Holly is going to become hardcore Holly and really make a name for himself. Rad Radford's not long for this world. He's ultimately going to have a pit stop in, uh, ECW and then go to WCW before passing away way, way too soon in 1998. What type of career do you think Rad Radford or Louis Spicoli would have had, had he not died so young? You know, I, I looked at Spicoli as one of those guys that right now, well, maybe not right now, but, uh, 10 years ago would have been a top guy would it would have been, um, I would have envisioned him. I'm not saying this is what he was, but I'm saying that he could have gotten there to be almost a Mr. Perfect Kurt Hennig working heel. Louie could bump his ass off great timing and as young as he was, had a natural ability. So, um, unfortunately his demons got the better of him and it was just such a sad, sad, tragic story because literally this kid could have had the world by the balls. He was, I think he was that talented. I really did. And from everybody we've ever heard from a hell of a great guy. Like everybody Sweet. enjoyed. I mean, just, I, 
oh my god, man, he was like, uh, you know, I said, guys, a sweet guy. Louis was one of those sweet souls that wouldn't hurt a fly that just wanted to have fun in life and, and wanted to wrestle. And great, great, great kid. We see uh, up and coming singing sensation Joni Wilson open the show. She's going to sing the Canadian national anthem. We looked her up and now she lives in Henderson, Tennessee. She sings and she's a real estate agent. Uh, how do you find people who are going to sing the Canadian national anthem in this era? You look in uh Canadian national anthems, are us and shit in the green pages. See, they don't have yellow pages. They have green pages up there and pink pages. I didn't know that I'm colorblind. Yeah. You're showing off. Well, see, there you go. And I think that that's where she was. No, she was a Canadian singer. I think Carl DeMarco brought her to us and said, Hey, this is literally, as you described it, this is an up and comer. And shit had Ricky Medlock sing it. So why not her? And old, an old bison head got the gig. Bison head got the gig. Vince McMahon, Jim Ross, and Jerry Lawler are on commentary for this uh, show, which is kind of fun. And as soon as they open, King's going to complain about having to be in Winnipeg. You idiot. And he says there are places like Florida and California. And Vince reminds him it is the world wrestling federation. I'm curious about the set here. You want to talk about deep in the weeds here? Why is it some of the in your house sets you have the video screen in the background and some you don't? It doesn't feel like it's very consistent. Like it looks like this every time. It probably depended upon where the setup was. It's just what we could get in and what looked better for that particular setup. Our first match is Triple H versus Rikishi. Wait, no. It's Hunter Hearst Helmsley pinning Fatu in eight minutes and six seconds with the pedigree. Meltzer would write Fatu worked much harder than usual and did a good job of carrying Helmsley, who they are clearly protecting and building for the future. Helmsley did his finisher after Fatu missed a splash off the top rope. Two stars. Uh, this, this is kind of a fun match. This is four years before their, you know, big time stars as Triple H and Rikishi. Hemsley's going to try to spray Fatu with a perfume bottle at the beginning of the match, which is sort of old school and fun. Makes you think of, uh, the original heel in wrestling and, uh, Fatu gets the early offense, delivers the back body drop. And, uh, throughout the match, Lawler's making all kinds of, oh, Fatu smells bad type jokes. Like you said, this Fatu was big and bad, but smell isn't everything. This is uh, an okay match, but it is kind of fun to see what these guys were capable of doing in 1995, knowing what is to come in the future. Yeah, it was just an okay match, but when you, you know, you look at it and you look at where both went, it's an interesting insight to the future and it wasn't, um, yeah, God, it wasn't holy shit, but. Yeah, decent opener. The finish did get a pop. The pedigree was over. The the first time people saw the pedigree, they popped for that. I'm not saying this is the first time he used it, but it is an interesting maneuver in a business where it feels like everything's been done. That was a nice little finish, especially in '95. Yes, it was. It was, and they did they did like it. But again, I, I for me watching it going back and looking at it is kind of like. Um, Holy shit, here we're going to be two of the biggest stars in in a very few years in the future. The um what is the worst pedigree you ever saw that one on Superstars in 96? Who was that kid's name from North Carolina who took it straight on his fucking head? Oh god. Was that Chris Champion? No, Champagne. Was- Champagne. Dude. Marty um uh- what a fucking pedigree that was, huh? Oh, good. Good Lord. Yes. Sham. First name, sham. Last name, pain. <laughs> sham pain, baby. Oh, uh, what was his last name? Marty Garner is his real Marty name. Marty Garner. Good Lord, man. But he, he took that shit like nobody ever did ever. Yeah. Have I told the story about Marty Garner being rock's assistant? You have before very briefly. Tell it again. Ah, it was just great because Marty was going to Hollywood when, when rock, you know, went and was doing his own thing in Hollywood, hired Marty as his assistant. 
and there's quotation marks around the word assistant. And Marty went out and got a laptop and got like some suits and all this shit and showed up to work. And he's all ready to be rock's assistant. And he's like, what are you doing? And he says, I'm ready, man. He goes, yeah, man. He goes, you don't need a computer or anything. You just need like a notepad. I need like a couple pairs of, uh, Adidas shoe or Nike shoes <laughs> this size, get some chicken sandwiches and here's how I want them. And I think it took the air out of Marty sales a little bit. He was, he was disappointed because he saw his future in Hollywood being bright. The bright lights of Hollywood, baby. First name, sham last name pain. After the match, while Hemsley is being interviewed, doing what Meltzer would call a total Steven Regal knockoff. Henry Godwin comes out with the slop bucket. Helmsley is going to hide behind Lawler. Who's doing the interviewing here. And Godwin then chases Helmsley away for an angle that Meltzer says basically went nowhere. And there were a few fan signs that were confiscated during the opening segment, including an ultimate warrior sign that was taken away from a front row fan. And, uh, of course we know that ultimate warrior is going to be here and what, six months, maybe a little more. And there's also a sign that says, you fucker. Hi, Todd. We see clearly for a second on the hard cam before the director cuts away. When do you remember signs becoming a real issue where guys were just trying to put curse words and offensive shit up there just to get a rise and get themselves over? I just think the, the more that they became popular and as raw it went live and people seeing the multitude of signs out there trying to sneak something in. Here's my problem with signs. And I think that everybody should, you know, say whatever you want. Don't be vulgar and don't hold it up all night long. People pay good money for the seats behind you. And more times than not, it, it's the thing that people leave out a lot of times on if somebody takes their sign is because they've been asked nicely. Okay, we've seen your sign. Um, and we're asking you, please don't keep your sign up and please don't hold your sign up because people behind you can't see. And it's okay, hold it up, but put it down. And if it's vulgar, look, you can't have that. There's kids here and shit like that. So there, there are reasons for things and, and guys that just try to get shit on TV. But <laughs> you fucker, hi, Todd, will probably be one of those that's not suitable for all audiences. Let's move along. Smoking guns up next. They're going to beat Razor Ramon and one, two, three kid in 12 minutes and 46 seconds. And they're going to retain the WWF tag titles in the process. Meltzer would say Billy Gunn had a new haircut to make him look like a tall Dean Douglas kid that a, did a subtle heel move early, pulling down the top rope. So Bart took a bump backwards over the top kid tagged in kid tagged in with a lot of quick kicks. The match was good, but not as good as one would expect, given that kid was involved and the crowd was subdued, except when Ramon did the turning the pile around spot, leading people to believe kid was going to get the pin and win the title. The match was also clumsy in spots as Ramon got the hot tag and set up the finish. Ramon did the razor's edge on Billy and stalled around while kid begged for the tag so he could win the title. After more stalling, Ramon does tag kid who went for the cocky pin, but Billy ended up crucifixing him to the mat and they're going to keep the title after the three count after the match kid did what was supposed to be a heel turn and threw a temper tantrum, shoving razor Ramon who walked out on him and beating up both guns. However, the turn didn't work live or on tape as the announcers didn't sell it as a turn and the crowd live booed the hell out of the guns when they were presented the belts and held them up after the match. The only real indication it was a turn is later in a 900 line segment where kid was being rude to the caller two and three quarter stars. I like the idea of one, two, three kid turning heel, but did we just underestimate how the guns weren't exactly over with this crowd? Did they not want to boo anything that razor was associated with? Did they respect Sean Waltman as a worker or was the creative just less than ideal? I just don't think they cared. Um, more than anything, I, I just don't think that, that they really cared about kid. And I don't think they cared about the guns. The only guy in the match that they did care about was razor and he wasn't directly involved, uh, in it. So it was flat. 
that's all there is to it. It's just one of those that you kind of look at and, oh, hey, this might be cool, but, you know, three of the four weren't over at that point. Let's, um, let's talk about the, the turn. We do see eventually where Sean Waltman's going to officiate a match on the raw before survivor series in November. It's between razor and Sid, and he's going to help Sid win with a fast count, which I guess makes the turn official. Did you prefer one, two, three kid as a baby face or a heel? Um, I say that because he's brought in as like the ultimate underdog. You don't see it coming, blah, blah, blah. Later when he's six and X-Pac and all that, you could argue, well, certainly there he was better as a heel, but one, two, three kid to me just feels like, oh, he's this undersized baby face who somehow was the, the underdog and he, he stole a victory. That's baby face stuff. It is. And that's what he was best at that point in his career. But I think Sean always wanted to be the lightning kid, the cocky, arrogant heel that worked with Jerry Lynn and, uh, Chaz in GWF. So to, to the kid, he was, he was this cocky heel and the underdog that despite everything actually overcame was what people were buying. And that's what they bought into. And that's what they wanted out of the one, two, three kid. So I think anything else at this point was kind of a force. The the audience was spitting it back up. They didn't want that. Let's keep it going here. Let's talk about the next match. It's a, it's a big match. By the way, the match we just covered with two and three quarter stars, the readers of the observer thought it was the best match. So that gives you an idea of what's to come, but it is history. What we're about to see. It's the in-ring debut of gold dust. Is going to pin Marty Jannetty in 11 minutes and 15 seconds with a face first suplex. Meltzer would say Goldust was given an elaborate ring entrance with stars from the lights and the lights turned down and glitter. However, once he took off his wig, he looked like a banana with black ears. The two were trying and Jannetty took some nice bumps, but they didn't work well together and missed a lot of spots. Most importantly, the crowd didn't react to the gimmick. When it was over, it came off as much ado about nothing star and a half. And of course we know that's not going to be the case for long. Eventually he's going to become one of the more controversial and hotter acts around chat me up though. what did you think of this initial outing was Vince disappointed that the fans didn't respond bigger. It feels like a lot was invested in the ring entrance and his look and the character. Was there an expectation that they would, I don't know, have a, a bigger reaction than this. I don't know because it, Look, to me, and watching it back, it was his uh, first string inter- introduction. It was his debut. It was a big thing. Um, I think that the audience was more in shock and didn't know how to react more than anything else. I don't think that they knew exactly how the hell to take this character. And when you take off the wig and you've got this close-cropped haircut – and black ears and all it was it was an awful lot to absorb all at once so from my vantage point i kind of looked at it like the audience just didn't know exactly how the hell to take this character standing in front of him he wasn't fish nor foul he was androgynous oh God. and it was um th- there was no issue with marty the the whole thing was about gold dust debut I thought it was cool. And the black ears are really cool. Vince says that Goldust is androgynous and Lawler asked him to repeat the word, which no one really knows the meaning of at the time. And King says, well, McMahon, you have a point. And you can even hear Jr. start to laugh when he gets to the punchline. And if you put a hat on your head, you might cover it up. Pretty good little one-liner from Lawler. Oh, that's a fresh. That's a good one. King. On raw, when gorilla monsoon announces that the Mabel Yokozuna match is going to be taking place instead of the undertaker taking on Mabel, he said it was the first time that these two would wrestle each other, which is obviously not the case since they worked a program the prior year, but here we are. Yokozuna goes to a double count out with King Mabel in five minutes and 12 seconds. 
Uh, Mabel was said to have weighed a legitimate 580 pounds for this match. And he says, if that's the case, Yoko must be pushing 700. He called it a horrible match with a horrible finish and a strong candidate to be the worst match of the year. And he gave it negative two stars. <laughs> that was fucking awful. <laughs> it was fucking awful. It was like, you know, it's one of those that you see it, uh, uh, God damn on, on the independence and you see two fucking guys that have no right to be in the ring and thinking that everything, it, it was, it was fucking terrible. It was sad is what it was. And, um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. Did you see the, did you see the thing on Twitter? And I don't even know where, where the hell it is, where the guys on the turnbuckle. And no, 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 no. I don't want to. What? Nobody wants to talk about that. Everybody listening to this has seen that. It's painful to look at. Why, why do you want to talk about that? Because that's what this match reminded me of. Oh, it was that bad to watch? Yes. Dude, that motherfucker has grasshopper legs. I mean, good Lord. I, I, uh, somebody showed it to me uh, Monday night, and it, it was on a loop, and it kept going over, and I couldn't look away. But every single time that he hit, I was, I cringed and went, Oh God, no. And then I had to look again. By the way, we should mention that fella has a, uh, a GoFundMe because apparently he did not have, he's an indie guy, didn't have insurance His medical. He's had surgery now, but his medical bills are like over $200,000, which is just hard to imagine, but that's, that's where we are. Uh, so. Well, yeah, and some people don't belong in the ring, and you know, in, in in this case, this was one of those that that was watching this match where you just go, "Good lord!" Um, probably anything else would have been better. It was bad. It was real bad. Yeah, it's ugly. We should mention um, if you want to go check him out, it's 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 on uh, it's on GoFundMe. Uh, just uh. I don't even know what to say. I feel bad for the kid. The guy's name's Justin, by the way. So, not mm-hmm. fun. Not not fun to look at. Let's move on. Of course, we know that's the worst match of the night. It's not even close. The readers of the Wrestling Observer uh, agree. I guess my question is: When we know that two giant men like this is not going to make for a good match, why does it keep getting booked over and over throughout wrestling history? I think that there is a, and and frankly, a large segment of the audience that is looking for the spectacle and the collision and to see what the two, you know, like the two biggest and strongest when they finally meet someone their own size and and of their own ability. What's going to happen? What's going to come out of that? And all too often, with very few exceptions, it's, it's not good because they both have the same gimmick and you can't do the same spots with the guy that does all your spots. So that's difficult. Let's, uh, let's talk about the next match before we do. We should talk about Shawn Michaels. He comes out next. He's been on a monster baby face run since WrestleMania 11. He won the intercontinental belt from Jeff Jarrett at the second in your house in Nashville. And he's going to lose it here tonight without ever wrestling a match. Michaels would, uh, be written up in the newsletter as this. Sean Michaels appeared totally out of character with noticeable marks around his face, particularly under the eyes and around the upper lip at the Winnipeg pay-per-view show, walking slowly to the ring to hand the IC title to Douglas and walking away, looking incredibly sad as weird irony would have it. Michaels appeared in character on a show that aired the next morning. Tape before the incident on the Danny Bonaducci talk show, talking about being a chick magnet, man, this is sort of a, a famous moment where we see Sean come to the ring and hand the title to Dean Douglas. It would be replayed a lot. Sean's teary walk to the ring and that rather colorful jacket. What do you remember about this spectacle? Well, I, you know, it was. It was sad, first of all, because you sit there and, and once you saw Sean and you realize that this has now had almost a week or more, um, it's had a while to heal up. Okay. 
and you, you sit there and you think about, holy shit, um, how bad it, it, it must have been. And I actually did see pictures of him in the hospital, and it, it wasn't pretty by any stretch of the imagination. So uh, it, was, it was tough. You had to do something. And I think that there was a segment of the audience that felt, well, is this real? Is it not? So you, you show Sean, you show the, the injuries to his face, you show the injuries and make a story out of it is, is the best that you can. You're, you're dealt a set of cards and you got to play them the best way that you can at the time. Well, we're going to play them here. Ramon's going to pin Dean Douglas to win the intercontinental title in 11 minutes and one second. Meltzer would write. Before the match, Michael slowly walked to the ring with the cameras focusing on his battered and sad eyes, slowly gave up the title and slowly walked to the back. Those few minutes were a production masterpiece. Both the crowd and the match were dead early coming off of a downer and two basically did nothing for the first eight minutes. It appeared they were pacing for a 25 plus minute match. Ramon didn't even try and facially made that obvious. The last two minutes were very good with some nice moves and near falls before a flat finish where Ramon used a back suplex and both fell down. Ramon had his arm draped on Douglas and the ref counted three. The ring announcer did the tease saying the winner and intercontinental champ razor Ramon Douglas's leg was under the ropes to give him his out, but this was real bad. One star lot to unpack here. You know, we all agree that they did a great job with the Sean story. But it's almost written in code here that Dave maybe is insinuating Razor Ramon was sandbagging Shane Douglas. And of course, Shane would be very vocal about his treatment from the click and the way they handled him. And there's even a famous story out there where allegedly someone overheard them talking about Dean Douglas and Scott Hall insinuating, hey, let's not get him fired. Let's just starve him out. And obviously Shane Douglas is not long for the world wrestling federation. And later when he's in ECW and Scott Hall finds himself looking for a gig, when his days in WCW were drying up, he shows up to an ECW show and is uh, shown the door by Mr. Douglas, remembering his treatment here in the WWF. When you watch this match back, do you think there's something to that? Did, did razor sandbag? Shane Douglas, did he not want him to be successful? Was there a personal issue or was it just bad chemistry in your opinion? Horrible chemistry. They didn't like each other and they had horrible chemistry. And I think that razor felt that, uh, Shane was not, was not up to speed. Didn't come in in the kind of shape that he felt he should have been able to come in. Couldn't keep up. And I think all that played into it, but they had no chemistry at all. And didn't really care for one another. I think it showed, but it, yeah, it, it was, it was nothing, <laughs> you know, it was, it was a lot of walking, talking and, and getting to, to a finish to try to maybe have a, uh, personal issue after the fact, but I don't think people by this point, you know, it's kind of a bummer because it's a baby face vacating the title the way that Sean did. And you, you could have put anybody out there and I don't think that they would have been happy. He gets a rematch for the intercontinental title against razor on the December 4th raw. They do an in your house and his last appearance on WWF television was in your house five where he was booked to wrestle Ahmed Johnson. And, um, the, the storyline was his back was not in wrestling condition. So he introduces buddy Landale as his substitute. And he's defeated by Ahmed in 42 seconds. I think his very last day with the company was a show in Madison square garden, where he said he had a severe muscle spasm in his back. And if agitated, it could have paralyzed him. And, uh, Vince McMahon basically is pissed off at this news and allegedly tried to get Shane to admit that this was all bullshit. And, uh, he's out of there. It just feels like. This thing is snake bit with Shane Douglas in the company. Do you think this was the beginning of the end that maybe he did believe in the character? He being Vince and thought, man, we can do something with this. Cause he's putting him with razor and originally Sean for the intercontinental title. And he certainly had time with vignettes as painful as they were to watch. 
but they were trying something. And then the match here just sucks. And it feels like if at worst case, it's the beginning of the end. Would you agree? I would agree. I, I don't think that, you know, I think Shane came in with a lot of uh, pomp and circumstance and quite a bit of anticipation. And I don't think that his performance met that in anticipation. That's all there is to it. Is the thought here. You've told us before, carry me through it. But a lot of times the idea is if you have to have a substitution, then whoever, whatever the substitution is, it has to be better than the original thing. So if, if so-and-so can't make the show and he's been advertised and, and now we've got to break that news, we need to come back with, we've got an even bigger star. And I'm not saying razor necessarily was the bigger star than Shawn Michaels. I'm not insinuating that at all, but perhaps giving the title to Dean and then having a baby face beat him makes it feel like a feel good moment for the live crowd. Is that right? Well, I think, yes, definitely. Because again, you're sitting there and it's a baby face who's vacating the championship. And I would argue that the next biggest star in the company was razor. So this was, yes, let's, let's put razor out there and have a baby face finish here because they're going to feel even worse. If now your substitution comes out and he gets beat by the heel. So no, this was strictly something to do for the audience, uh, live and at home to make them happy. One of the things as one could be right. Well, normally when you have somebody who can't compete like this, you, you vacate the title, you have a tournament, you crown a new champion. Instead, let's just give the belt to the bad guy and say he has to forfeit it. Cause Sean can't compete. And then let's have the good guy get the revenge, send everybody home happy. Yeah. Different, a lot of different ways to do things. Let's I don't think about, there's a, I don't think there's a manual that says, okay, no, no, no. champion can't compete. You have to have a tournament for it. I'm not saying that at all. I'm just saying that's probably the thinking of, Hey, we're not, we don't have the undertaker here. And now Shawn Michaels is off. We got to have some sort of fucking feel good moment. And it can feel like a major happening if they see a title switch. And it's one of their favorites winning over a guy that everybody hates. Exactly. It's main event time. As a reminder, the bulldog has recently turned heel during a tag match on raw by attacking his partner, diesel bulldog, then cut off his dreadlocks and went with a crew cut. We haven't spent a lot of time talking about that. I liked bulldog with the dreadlocks. Why do you think he switched it up here? Is this someone from creative services or Vince wanting him to switch it up? Or is this just Davey's call? No, th this was something that we discussed and it was something Davey wanted to do. I think he looked a thousand times better with the short hair, but his shoulders were huge. Um, I just thought he looked a hell of a lot better with, with the crew cut and the short hair. In my opinion, I hated the dreadlocks. It, it just didn't fit to me. It was like, he was trying to be something that he wasn't with the dreadlocks in my opinion. So I was a big proponent of the, yes, please. Good God update and change your look. And it was, and that's what it was for. It was to change his look and try and freshen it up from, I think he'd had the dreadlocks in WCW prior to that. I just didn't think that it fit him. Next up our main event, Diesel's going to retain the title, beating Davy boy in 18 minutes and 14 seconds. Woof. It was like a long time for a diesel match. That's what right. Virtually the entire match was Smith working on diesel's left knee. Diesel sold the knee so well. It was a logical match that would have been a good match. If the crowd was educated to submissions, which they aren't, if they had done a good five minutes at the end, which they didn't, and it had a strong finish, which it had anything, but so it came off as a boring match early in the match. Diesel took a bump outside the ring and crashed into Brett Hart, who was doing commentary and shoved Brett hard during the match. Smith used a sharpshooter, but diesel powered out to tell the story that he may be able to survive Brett's finisher later in the match. Diesel made his comeback, starting by pushing Smith off as he went for the power slam and kicked him in the face. Jim Cornette, who interfered more than any heel manager in a WWF title match in years, wound up crashing in Smith's way and got hit with a forearm. Smith ended up posting diesel outside the ring and slapped hard at ringside. Hart jumped into the ring and went wild on Smith for a DQ. And, uh, it's a DQ on diesel for outside interference. 
So Diesel then attacks Brett for costing him the match, and it's going to build up their singles match, which is the November 19th pay per view show. And they go off the air with a pull apart brawl. I don't hate the idea of the story they're trying to tell to build towards the next pay per view. I do like the idea of them putting Brett's finisher on and Diesel powering out. All that's good stuff. But a DQ in, and we're spending money for it. It does feel like a little bit of a letdown. What do you think? Um, I, it was, it was boring. Here's the problem. Uh, it was, we're trying to get Davy boy over as a heel and trying to tell the story with Brett and diesel. And it was convoluted. It was go see, Razor Ramon versus Dean Douglas. There wasn't really any chemistry with Bulldog and Kevin Nash. Add that into the mix, and it was trying to tell too many stories at one time uh, from the standpoint of, hey, guys, we've got this. We're promoting to the next show, and it just wasn't a really good execution. The match could have, frankly, could have been at least 10 minutes shorter, and I wouldn't have minded to do the same thing, but it, um, it, it was the, the, the cherry on the Sunday of this pay-per-view. Um, and it was like a, a really old rotten cherry that was at the bottom of the fucking jar. <laughs> you put it on there and the ice cream was actually yogurt, but it was the cheap kind of yogurt where they just used the powder to make the chocolate. And Yeah. And the chocolate syrup was Nestle's quick. It wasn't good. It just wasn't good. I don't know how else to say it, but um, the show was not easy to watch. It wasn't one of our best efforts. Well, unfortunately, Vince McMahon agreed. There's an interesting story in the observer about the end of the show quote, just as the cameras faded to black, signifying the end of the in your house pay-per-view show in Winnipeg. A disgusted Vince McMahon threw down his glasses and his headset and said the words horrible as he started to walk to the back with Jim Ross while the pull apart brawl with Bret Hart and diesel was still going on in the ring. Seconds later, as the brawl ended diesel, the person McMahon had planned to build his company around one year earlier was being booed out of the building yet another in the long line of failed experiments in his quest to find the new Hulk Hogan. The virtually unanimous crowd reaction to diesel after yet another unimpressive main event match seems to make it only logical that Bret Hart is destined to have a career similar to the man who has being compared with results in outbursts, Rick flair, like flair Hart is the man picked to pick up the pieces time after time when experiments of creating new world champions, that will be the next big thing in wrestling end up with declining box office figures. Do you remember Vince being upset at the end of this show? I, I, I don't recall that specifically. I, I would imagine going back and looking at this show is one of those that I probably wanted to forget immediately. Um, and I wouldn't be surprised if Vince felt the same way because it wasn't a good show. It didn't flow. It was, um, just drudging all the way through from, from start to finish. And it just, just sucked. That's the only way to say it, man. It, it, it sucked. Probably would have had to improve just suck, but it was one of those situations where, okay, you know, you look at it and you're back to the drawing board and it was to get to a November pay-per-view survivor series. So you're looking at it like, okay, this is half ass a freebie. And you can make every excuse in the world. Oh, October is never really a good month for us and, and shit like that. Um, we were snake bit on, on injuries and uh, trying to get to Brett and Diesel along the way. And along the way, it just wasn't a good story to tell. Talk to me a little bit about where we were at this point. Did you already have WrestleMania 12 mapped out? I mean, I, I know that sounds funny, but on this show, we've got Bret Hart doing commentary. So we're building to Brett and diesel. We know that we're coming off of WrestleMania with diesel and Sean. 
But Sean, who a lot of people thought was the heir apparent, if you will, he just got his ass beat and had to forfeit the intercontinental title. Did you already know they're doing for WrestleMania 12 at this point? Yes. As far as Sean and Brett. Yes. Um, but is, as I say, you know, you're, you're at this particular exact point of this pay-per-view. I think there were doubts with the whole Sean injury. Yeah. That's what's fascinating to me is it does feel like, well, what can Sean do or not do? We know we've got Brett, but this show feels like we know diesel ain't it. This is the end of the experiment. This is the end of us trying that. We're just going to get to the next show, get it back on Brett, and then we'll figure it out. Yeah, it was, but it was also, there was that build underneath with Sean in the intercontinental championship and hoping to get Sean where you wanted to get Sean. So in our mind, yes, we were already getting there because Vince had made the decision to turn Sean baby face and, and, and let's go with it. So help me understand then. Let's, let's go down that rabbit hole for a minute. And I know you get annoyed when I do it. So bear with me. If Sean didn't forfeit the title here, who would he have lost it to and win? Or would the plan have been WrestleMania 12 world champion versus intercontinental champion like six years prior? Well, I tell you at the time, one of the people that was in consideration to get that championship was Dean Douglas. But uh, because of the, the booking here, we felt like we're out undertaker, we're out Shawn Michaels. We're not doing a title switch in the main. We got to do something noteworthy. Send them home. Happy big baby face pop. So maybe between now and, you know, Royal rumble ish, Dean would have had the rematch and, and got the belt off him. Yeah. I, and again, I don't remember exactly how the hell we had it, but I do know that Dean was talked about to be that intercontinental champion and then get Sean moving on to the title at WrestleMania 12. Um, it was a little turbulent times here because you, you lost undertaker and now you lost Sean. And it's like, fuck. Right. Um, what's next? Let's talk about what's next on the show. For those who were in attendance, I can't believe this is real. Mark Canterbury, Henry Godwin beat Sid after this. I can't believe that's real, but. Uh, Henry Godwin beats Sid and then Lawler does a five minute monologue insulting Winnipeg. Uh, and then of course, eventually, uh, Isaac Yankum is here. <laughs> oh my goodness. Lawler and skip are in Isaac Yankum's corner. And, uh, we've got some folks from the Winnipeg blue bombers in the corner of, of Bret Hart and what a fucking weird time this is. We've also got Owen Hart and Yokozuna beating Savio Vega and Bam Bam Bigelow. It's a weird show. Uh, overall, you watched it this week for the first time in freaking 25 years. Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs in the middle. Oh, it's fucking horrible. Yeah. Pissed off that I had to watch it. The best match, everyone seemingly agreed. It's the Smoking Guns and Kid and Razor. The worst match, everyone agrees. King, Mabel, and Yokozuna. Uh, but next week is a really good match here on the show. Uh, I've had a lot of fun talking about the old school stuff with you. And next week is pretty old school, man. King Kong Bundy. We're going to do a profile on him. We're going to hope to get to uh, taboo Tuesday, 2005 as well. But the main event, mark your calendars, boys and girls. It's November 13th. Eddie Guerrero, one of our most requested shows. We saved it for this particular anniversary. I can't believe this is a real thing, but that'll be the 15 year anniversary of Eddie's passing. We're also going to get to Survivor Series 95 and Survivor Series 05 before the end of November. But right now, let's hit some questions, man. Uh, Matthew Dawkins has a question that we don't talk about a lot here. Uh, someone who was released by the WWF shortly ahead of this pay-per-view was interviewer Stephanie Wyand. Can Bruce tell us about late 94 and early 95, this member of the crew? Any fun stories about Stephanie? Stephanie wasn't there long enough to have any fun stories. Stephanie was part of... The uh, Charlie Men, Stephanie, came in for some new, young, different talent outside of the wrestling business to host different studio shows. She was the host of Mania, which we did out of Master Control. And we were looking to do more Stanford-based stuff. We used her as a backstage interviewer. Nice lady, but 
just didn't fit. Jim Cornette stated he went up to Vince after the main event and apologized for how bad the match was. Bruce, what do you think that sounded like? God damn, I suck. What the fuck? I can't even get a good goddamn hamburger, cheeseburger in this fucking country. Get me the fuck out of here. And pin away, motherfucker. Troy wants to know. Fuck you, motherfucker. Thank you. Fucker. Troy wants to know whether any considerations of putting the Intercontinental belt on anyone other than Razor. He seemed to be a solid choice, but he'd already had a match that night. So was there anyone else discussed? And uh was there any chance? Not really. No. I mean it was do you do you leave it on Dean and get the heat, but it was disgusting heat? Or do you do you put it on Razor? And Razor was really the only candidate at that point. Jason has a great question here. Why is Bret Hart not on a Canadian pay per view? I can't, I know he's on commentary, but you know what I mean. Why did he not have a match? Again, it was an in-your-house, and that these were designed to have a little bit different cards, and you didn't get all the major stars on every one of them. Mark wants to know, why was Winnipeg chosen for a pay-per-view? The company only did a few TVs there. Any insight as to why Winnipeg was chosen here? Probably because it was close to Detroit. It's about the only reason I can think of. Detroit's always been a great market. Winnipeg's always been a good fucking hell of a wrestling market. Adam wants to know why does Bruce think Davy boy was so over in the UK, but never quite reached that same level here in America because he was British. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, uh, you know, I think that Davy boy was over to a, to a big extent. Davy and, and uh, dynamite is a tag team is the bulldogs. I think we're over. And I think that Davey also reached a level of success of singles that um, he was over to a point. Was he a megastar? No, but he was sure as fuck over. Oh, no doubt about that. Jaden wants to know what was Vince's first impressions of the debut match of gold dust. Did he think he'd pick the wrong guy or that the uh, gimmick was maybe not the right time or just needed a little more time. It needed more time. And, and I don't know that anyone, I, well, I take that back. I think that from my vantage point, I was expecting a bigger reaction of a holy shit. What the fuck is this? And people, I gave, I think I gave the audience more credit for, from, from this standpoint that, oh my God, everybody, you know, it's Dustin Rhodes and this is such a cool gimmick, but they didn't and they didn't care and they were just into the gimmick and the gimmick wasn't fully fleshed out yet. So we were looking at it as, all right, uh, we got, we got more work to do here, but it wasn't given up on it at all because it definitely cool look, cool presentation. And we still had high hopes for it. Steven's asking the question. I think a lot of people are asking. Never got why the belt went back to Razor, who was in the middle of a feud with Kid. At the next in your house, Ramon teamed with Janetti and never defended the belt. Seems like a click decision with lack of foresight to me. Lots of people wrote in and thought, was this the click doing their deal? Where, yeah, Sean's got to give it up and that sucks, but one of his buddies is going to get it right away, even if maybe it's not the most thought out idea. Well, it wasn't the most thought out idea because it was something that had to be made pretty much on the spot as we got closer to it. And we didn't have time to build anything else up. You got to remember also during this time, we were still, you know, banking a lot on syndication and, and you had, uh, we were taping and going live on raw. So you didn't have the time to adjust the way that it became when you went live every week. So the click had nothing to do with that decision. Well, we've got a lot to do with the decision next week. We're talking about King Kong Bundy, pretty excited to be talking about old school. And, uh, I just hope that we get to hear your Ernie Ladd impression a few times. Monday. You'll get it next week. You will get it next week. And we hope that you get it every single week. Don't forget to, uh, Keep Tracy Smothers family in your thoughts and prayers and 
if a GoFundMe comes up for some other expenses they need, we will be sure to tweet that out over at Pritchard Show. He is at Bruce Pritchard. I am at Hey Hey, it's Conrad, and we are out of time. We'll see you next week right here on Something to Wrestle with Bruce Pritchard. Rock on and hug the ones you love this week and let them know you love them. Hey, hey, it's Conrad Thompson. Thanks for checking out the podcast here on YouTube. Be sure to hit the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you get a notice anytime we upload some new content. And go save yourself some money right now. If you're in a 30-year loan or you have credit card debt, it's not a matter of if I can save you money. It's a matter of how much. Find out right now for free at SaveWithConrad.com.